Salam everyone, welcome back to Kalima Tayyiba series. Today is lesson number eight, and we'll continue our talk about the pillars of Iman or faith. We will talk about how lucky we are to be from the Ummah or the nation of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and we'll end with the last pillar of Iman. So stay put. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, wa salatu wa salamu ala khayrin mursaleen, sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Allahumma allimna ma yanfa'una, wa anfa'na bima allamtana, wa zidna ilma. Dear Lord, teach us something beneficial, benefit us with what you teach us, and increase us in knowledge. We will start with a quick recap of our previous lesson to refresh our minds. So we went through the six pillars of Iman or faith, and we talked about believing in God, his angels, his books, his prophets, and the last day. On the last day, or the day of judgment, it will be so crowded because Allah will revive all humanity, from the first human being, Prophet Adam, till the last human being alive. And this event is called Al-Ba'th, or the resurrection. And then Allah will gather everyone in one place, and this event is called Al-Hashr, the assembly. And then we will all wait there for judgment time to begin. And the judgment time is called Al-Hisab, or the reckoning. And the wait will be so long that we, people will start to get worried. You know when you're waiting for your final grade of the school year, and this grade is really important to you because it will determine if you pass the year or not, it will de determine your GPA or score that might affect your uni application. Or if you're waiting for an acceptance letter and you keep checking the mail wondering, will it be a congratulation or a rejection letter? So before you receive that letter or before your grade or score comes out, you would be waiting nervously and apprehensively. Stress level, super high. And you just want it to be over. Get the plaster removed quickly and get it over with. Just tell me if I passed or not. You know that feeling? This will be the state of people during the assembly but stress level much, much higher. Because this time, the grade is not, not just about a uni application or a pass or fail of the school year, but it is a pass or fail of life. Prophet Muhammad وسلم, told us, the believers will be kept waiting on the day of resurrection so long that they will become worried and say, let us ask somebody to intercede for us with our Lord so that he may relieve us from this wait and start the judgment. So they will go to Prophet Adam and say, you are Adam, the father of the people. Will you intercede for us with your Lord so that he may relieve us from this place of ours? Prophet Adam will say, I'm not fit for this responsibility. And he will add, go to Noah, Nuh, the first prophet sent by Allah to the people of the earth. The people will go to Noah and will ask him the same question. Sayyidina Nuh alayhi salam will reply, I'm not fit for this task. And he will say to them, go to Abraham, Khalilur Rahman, the friend of God. They will go to Sayyidina Ibrahim alayhi salam who will say, I'm not fit for this undertaking. And he will tell them, go to, go to Moses, Sayyidina Musa, Kalimullah, the one who talked with God. He's a servant whom Allah gave the Torah, at Tawrat, and spoke to directly and brought near him for conversation. They will go to Sayyidina Musa who will say, I'm not fit for this task. And he will say to them, go to Jesus, Sayyidina Isa alayhi salam, Kalimatullah, the word of God. He is Allah's servant and his messenger, and a soul created by God and his word be, and it is, kun fayakun. You know, all of us are created from a mother and a father. So you have the union of 23 chromosomes from a male origin and 23 chromosomes from a female origin. And Allah creates a cell with 46 chromosomes. And the cell starts to multiply to form a human being, correct? Now, all of humanity was created this way for the exception of three people. The first exception is Prophet Adam alayhi salam. He was created with no parents whatsoever since he is the first human being created. The second exception is his wife, Hawa, Eve. She's our mother and she was created by Allah from Adam. So basically she has a male origin, but not a female origin. So she didn't have a mother. And the third exception is Prophet Jesus, Sayyidina Isa alayhi salam, because he was created from a mother, Mary, Maryam alayhi salam, without a father. By the way, there's a whole surah in the Quran named after Maryam alayhi salam, the mother of Jesus. Now, these three exceptions show us that God is al-Qadr, the capable, the powerful. He can create us in any way he pleases, and he can create anything he wants with kun fayakun, be and it is. Anyway, back to our topic. The people will go to Prophet Jesus alayhi salam and will ask him just like they asked the rest of the prophets, will you intercede for us with Allah so that he may relieve us from this weight and start judgment day? And Prophet Isa alayhi salam will answer them, I'm not fit for this task. But you'd better go to Muhammad, the servant whose past and future sins have been forgiven by Allah. 
Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam continues his hadith and he says, so they will come to me and I will ask Allah's permission to enter his presence and then I will be permitted. I will fall down in prostration before him and then Allah will say, O Muhammad, lift up your head and speak for you will be listened to and intercede for your intercession will be accepted and ask for anything for it will be granted. So Prophet Muhammad والسلام, will ask Allah to commence the judgment day and Allah will accept his demand and the people will be relieved from their weight and the judgment starts. Allah has granted our beloved Prophet وسلم, many favors and we will, talk about, we will talk about them. And one of the major favors is his intercession on the day of judgment. And intercession, shafa'a, means intervention or mediation or negotiation. It is one of the blessings of distinction that is the mark of the excellence of Prophet Muhammad So we are very lucky to be among his followers. Prophet Muhammad has VIP position on that day, and it's called the praiseworthy station, al-maqam al-mahmud, which refers to the major intercession that has been singularly reserved for Prophet Muhammad and that no other prophet is given. And we talked last time about the VIP lounge for the followers of Prophet Muhammad called al-hawd, or the basin. On that difficult, hot, and crowded day, there will be a fountain of water all the way to the front of the assembly. And how will Prophet Muhammad recognize us to invite us to that haud? By the light coming out of our faces, hands, and feet because of ablution or wudu. So by then, Prophet Muhammad interceded for the believers to stop the wait and start the, the day of judgment. And I told you there will be a scale called al mizan, which is like an instrument that can measure actions. Just like there's a seismograph to measure earthquakes, an ECG to measure electrical impulses of the heart, a scale that can measure our weight, Allah created the mizan, which is an instrument that can measure actions. The good deeds and the bad ones will be measured to see which side outweighs the other to determine the fate of each person. By the way, I want to tell you that we are really lucky to be from the followers of Prophet Muhammad Wasallam. It's really an honor for us because Prophet Muhammad has so many VIP passes and positions that we can benefit from just by being among his followers. For the people of previous prophets, every good action they do, they are rewarded for it by one good deed. Now, the followers of Prophet Muhammad are very lucky because they will get special treatment. You know when there's someone you love, really love, you don't treat them like everyone else. You always give them special attention. And we said each prophet had a certain title. For example, Prophet Abraham, Sayyidina Ibrahim was Khalilul Rahman, the friend of God. Prophet Musa, Sayyidina Musa alayhi salam was Kalimullah, the one who talked to God. Prophet Jesus, Sayyidina Isa alayhi salam was Kalim, Kalimatullah, the word of God. Now, what's the title of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam? He is Habibullah, the most beloved person to God. And because of that, the followers of Prophet Muhammad will also get special treatment. So we said for the people of previous prophets, every good action they do, they're rewarded for it by one good deed. Now, because we are from the followers of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the most beloved person to Allah, every good action we do is multiplied by 10. So it will be considered 10 good deeds on the good side of the mizan instead of just one. And this is just for the sake of Habibullah, Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And just to give you an idea of how easy it is to collect good deeds. Remember, in our previous lessons, we explained the first few verses of Surah Al-Baqarah. And the first verse was Alif Lam Mim. How many deeds do we get by simply saying Alif Lam Mim? Prophet Muhammad tells us, with every letter you read from the Quran, you will get one deed. And every deed is multiplied by 10. And Alif Lam Mim is not considered one letter. Alif is a letter, Lam is a letter, and Mim is a letter. So by simply saying Alif Lam Mim, that's three times 10. So 30 deeds added to the scale. And this times 10 feature is just for the followers or the Ummah, the nation of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Now during the day of judgment, each one of us will be watching his life, every single detail of it, just like we watch a movie. And all the actions we see will be measured on the Mizan. Now there will be three categories of people. The worst category are the people whose bad deeds will outweigh the, their good deeds and they will go to hell. The second category are the people whose good deeds will outweigh the bad ones and they will go to paradise. But there's a very special category of people and we should ask Allah to make us among them. And they are the third category. They are the people who will be exempted from the action measurement and they will be immediately entered to paradise. These people had a clear mission when they were alive and it was to understand and live by the 99 names of Allah. 
And because they did that during their lives on earth, Allah will exempt them from the reckoning step of the day of judgment. Think about it for a second. It's just like the students in school. Students who get really high grades during, during the year, they will be exempted from the final year exam and they will be immediately admitted to the next level or class. Students who had an average score will have to sit for the final year exam and the teacher will check their grade to see if they move to the next level or not. And they're like the people who will have their deeds measured and eventually their good deeds will outweigh. But you know what? They had to go through the exam and they had to go through the reckoning, which is not easy. And the third type of people are the ones who really didn't pay attention all year long. So during their final year exam, they fail and they're not admitted to the next level, similar to the ones whom their bad deeds outweigh their good ones. Now, Prophet Muhammad وسلم, was sent out as a mercy to all mankind. His mercy and empathy toward his followers are so immense that he used to pray for each one of us by name. How is that possible? He lived almost 1,400 years before us. But it is Allah who gave him the knowledge of knowing the names of all his followers. So he knows us by name. And I told you every time we pray and send peace and blessings to him by saying, Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa alihi wa sallim, an angel sends him our prayer. And if it's Friday, he receives it immediately. If I want to pick one advice to give to you, it would be to increase your prayers on the Prophet. If you can reach 100 times per day, that would be so beneficial to you in this world and the hereafter. Prophet Muhammad وسلم, said, the one that sends me 100 blessings per day, Allah will serve 100 needs for them, 70 from the needs of the final day and 30 from the worldly needs. Also, by sending blessings on the Prophet, you are, you are fulfilling the command of God. Allah clearly commands the believers in the Quran to send blessings on the Prophet Muhammad. Inna Allah wa malaikatahu yusalluna ala nabi. Indeed, Allah and his angels send blessings upon the Prophet. Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima. O oh, you who have believed, ask Allah to send blessing and peace upon him. Now, what are the benefits of sending blessing and peace to the Prophet? First, all your concerns will be lifted. When the companion Ubay bin Kaab asked the messenger, what would happen if I dedicated all my supplications towards sending blessings on you? The Prophet replied, your needs will be satisfied and your sins will be forgiven. He also said, whoever sends blessings upon you once, Allah will erase 10 sins from him and will raise him 10 degrees in status. Second, Allah will send blessings on you. Prophet Muhammad وسلم, said, whoever sends blessings upon me, Allah will send blessings upon them tenfold. Third, the Prophet will receive and return your greetings. The Messenger of Allah said, Allah has angels who go around on earth, conveying to me the salam of my ummah, of my followers. And he also said, there is no one who sends salam upon me, but Allah will restore to me my soul so that I may return his salam. Fourth, it helps get your dua accepted. Prophet Muhammad وسلم, said, dua is suspended between heaven and earth, and none of it is taken up until you send blessings upon your Prophet. Finally, it will draw you closer to the Prophet. Prophet Muhammad said, the closest of people to me on the day of resurrection will be those who send the most blessings upon me. If you want to be close to the most beloved person to Allah, we need to increase our prayers upon him. So make it a habit every day. Don't let any day pass without sending blessings to the Prophet. While you're cleaning your room, driving somewhere, whenever you find free time, fill it and take advantage of it by sending blessings to the Prophet. And you will benefit so much. You'll feel happier, more productive, and God will take care of your needs. We said Prophet Muhammad was sent out as a mercy to all mankind. He's a mercy to each one of us. He knows us by name, and he used to pray for us during his lifetime. Once he said, I wish I could meet my brothers. His companions said, Aren't, are we not your brothers? The Prophet answered, you are my companions. But my brothers are those who have faith in me, although they never saw me. He's talking about us. We are among the people who believe in him, although we never saw him. And he used to talk about, he used to talk about us to his companions, even to his wife. Once his wife Aisha radiallahu anha saw the Prophet وسلم, with a cheerful face. So she asked him, can you supplicate to Allah for me? The Prophet said, oh Allah, forgive Aisha for her past and future sins in secret and in public. And Aisha was really happy. The Prophet asked her, does my supplication make you happy? Aisha said, why would your supplication not make me happy? The Prophet said, by Allah, it is my supplication for my nation, my ummah, in every prayer. Imagine 
in every prayer, Prophet Muhammad used to supplicate for us. God gave him the knowledge of knowing every one of us person by person. So he will be very sad if one of his followers fails the Mizan measurement. So he will use his VIP position, the praiseworthy station, Al Maqam Al Mahmud, and he will intercede for the people who failed the measurement on the Mizan, and he will ask Allah to forgive them. The Prophet said, On the Day of Judgment, I will ask my Lord for permission to enter his presence another time, and I will be permitted. I will prostrate to him, then I will raise my head and glorify my Lord. Allah will answer Prophet Muhammad and will tell him, O Muhammad, lift up your head and speak, for you will be listened to, and intercede, for your intercession will be accepted and ask for anything for it will be granted. And Prophet Muhammad will say, Ummati, Ummati, my nation, my nation, and I will go and take them out of hell and let them enter paradise. And then I will return, and I will return for the third time, and I will ask my Lord for permission to enter his presence, and I will be allowed to enter. And I will ask to take them out of hell and let them enter paradise, till none will remain in the fire, except those whom Quran will imprison, meaning those who were pure evil. Prophet Muhammad وسلم, will intercede for any person who has at least a small amount of good in his heart. If someone said, La ilaha illallah, there's no God but Allah, and has, and has in his heart goodness, weighing a barley corn, then Sayyidina Muhammad will intercede for them and will take them out of hell. If someone said, La ilaha illallah, and has in his heart goodness, weighing one grain of wheat, then Sayyidina Muhammad will intercede for them and will take them out of hell. If someone said, La ilaha illallah, and has in his heart goodness weighing an atom, Sayyidina Muhammad will intercede for them and will take them out of hell. Do you know what's the size of an atom? If someone has this amount of goodness in their heart and said, La ilaha illallah, there's no God but Allah, Prophet Muhammad will intercede for them because he loves us. He won't rest until all of us enter paradise. Whoever says, La ilaha illallah, enters paradise. لِكُلِّ شَيْءٍ مفتاح. Everything has its key. وَمِفْتَاحُ الْجَنَّةِ And the key to paradise is shahadat an la ilaha illallah, witnessing that there is no God but Allah. You see the importance of dhikr, la ilaha illallah? Whenever you say la ilaha illallah, a light enters in your heart. Nur la ilaha illallah. The Messenger of Allah, Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu wasallam said, Aqrabukum ilayya majlisan yawm al qiyamah, the most beloved and nearest to my gathering on the day of resurrection, ahasinukum akhlaqa, are those of you with the best character. That's why in our coming lessons, inshallah, we will be talking about the virtues of the Prophet so we get to know him better and apply those virtues so we become closer to him on the Day of Judgment. The key is to have good character, good values. That's the best thing you can acquire in this life. Now, the Prophet also tells us who are the people that will be the farthest from him on the Day of Judgment. He said, the most reprehensible of you to me and the furthest from my gathering on the Day of Resurrection will be at tharun the pompous, the blabbers, those who brag. والمتشدقون, the extravagant, those who rant, والمتفيهكون, and the pretentious. His companions ask, O Messenger of Allah, we know about the pompous and the extravagant, but who are the pretentious? The Prophet said, they are the arrogant. So we ask Allah to, to keep us from being arrogant, extravagant, and pompous. Now, a lot of you might be thinking, when is the Day of Judgment? And actually, a man once asked Prophet Muhammad وسلم, this question. What is the exact date of the Day of Judgment? And the Prophet answered him, What have you prepared for that day? So it really doesn't matter the timing of the last day because it's coming anyway. What matters is what we are preparing for that day. The Prophet's answer directs every Muslim to concern themselves before anything else with performing good deeds and acts of worship so as to be safe and close to the Prophet on that day and take advantage of the intercession, Shafa'at Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now we reach the last pillar of Iman, which is believing in the divine decree, the good and the bad. Al-Qadr khayrihi wa sharrihi. We will start with the explanation today and we'll continue in our, in our next, next lesson, inshallah. Believing in the Qadr khayrihi wa sharrihi is believing that Allah predestined some matters for us, over which we have no choice, such as our parents, the country we were born in, our appearance, our skin color, the language we are taught to speak, etc. So we believe that everything predestined for us by Allah is good for us, even if sometimes it might seem to us that it's not. Because we don't know any better. Our knowledge is limited and God's knowledge is infinite. He is Al-Hakim, the All-Wise. That's why we should always be content with what God predestined for us. We should be assured that He knows us and He knows our needs better than we know ourselves. God says in the Quran, You may hate a thing, though it could be good for you. 
وعسى أن تحبوا شيئا وهو شر لكم and you may love a thing though it could be bad for you والله يعلم وأنتم لا تعلمون and Allah knows and you do not know if Allah created some people rich then it is best for them and if he created some people poor it is also the best for them because God chooses the best for every person if you look a certain way or you think that you're disadvantaged or you think that life is not fair know that this is your ignorance speaking rest assured that this is the best for you the good is in what Allah Ta'ala chooses for you even if you don't see it when parents take their kids to get vaccinated the kids hate it they start to cry and they might feel pain but their parents see the big picture and they know that this pain is eventually is eventually to the to the kids benefit right you have to know that Allah is a rahim the most merciful. He is more merciful on us than our mothers and fathers are. He is Al-Alim Al-Hakim, the all-knowing and the all-wise, who chooses what is beneficial for us. Allah Ta'ala said, you may hate a thing, though it could be good for you. And you may love a thing, though it could be bad for you. And Allah knows and you do not know. I will give you an example to explain this verse. The numbers I will use are not real. They're just an approximation for you to understand the concept. And if you understand it, you will be able to apply it to any life situation. In general, life situations can be divided into three categories. As-sabr ala ta'a, being patient for doing a good deed. As-sabr ala al-ma'asiyah, being patient for avoiding a bad deed. And as-sabr ala al-bala, being patient during a hardship or tribulation. These three categories are actually levels. The lowest is being patient for a good deed. And the highest is being patient during a hardship. I'll explain more, but please pay attention because this is a really important concept that can change your perspective in life. I'll give you the example of the $100 bill. Imagine there's a $100 bill and you decide to do charity or sadaqah. So you basically give up $100 for the sake of Allah. You could have used this $100 to buy something for yourself, to buy a new jacket or a new game, but instead you put God first and you invested this $100 into doing good deeds. Allah, of course, will reward you for that with 1,000 deeds, let's say. So as sabr ala ta'a, being patient for doing a good deed, earned you 1,000 deeds. Now imagine your friend invites you to a party and he tells you, we will have so much fun. There will be a poker game with the guys and I have a way that can guarantee you will win $100. And you know that games of chance or gambling are forbidden. So you decline the invitation. You could have gone there, had fun and gained $100, but you avoided it for the sake of Allah. This is called a sabr ala al-masiyah, being patient for avoiding a bad deed. Allah, of course, will reward you for that with 2,000 deeds. Giving up the $100 will get you higher deeds than actually paying it for charity. Can you imagine the reward for it? Now, imagine your young nephew takes your phone without you noticing, drops it on the floor, and breaks your screen. Now, at first you felt really angry and you felt like screaming and shouting at him, but you got a hold of yourself. You remembered that uncontrolled anger is very bad. In fact, Prophet Muhammad وسلم, never got angry for a worldly matter. So you didn't shout at the kid because he doesn't know any better. Now the problem is that when you went to fix your screen at the shop, they tell you that it costs $100 to fix it. Now, if you are an average person, you would feel really bad while paying this $100. But if you are a true believer, you would say, inna lillahu inna ilayhi raji'un, which means surely we belong to Allah and surely to him we shall return. It's called istirja. You are returning your problem and yourself to God. And that means you were patient during a hardship. And Allah will reward you with 5,000 deeds when you pay that $100. Why? Because you were patient during a hardship. And this is the highest level of patience. Imagine paying $100 to fix your phone can earn you more deeds than paying $100 for charity. This is crazy. When I understood this perspective, I started seeing hardships in a different way. Instead of paying that $100 with bitterness in your heart and anger toward the kid who broke it, you are paying it with a smile on your face because now you know that Allah put you in this hardship to reward you with good deeds. If you are happy when you pay $100 to a poor person, you should be 10 times happier when you pay it in a hardship because Allah the wise put you in it to reward you and he always wants good for you. He put you in this hardship to offer you a great amount of deeds that will benefit you for your eternal life. You know how insurance policies ask for fees? So you pay them money on a regular basis, and if something bad happens to you, they help you pay for it. So for example, if you hit your car and you have insurance, they help you pay to fix it. If you fall down and break your leg and you have insurance, they help you pay for your hospital fees. 
Prophet Muhammad وسلم, taught us a dua to say that will grant us insurance from God, the creator of everything. If you say it, you have a promise from Allah that whatever hardship happens to you, he will replace it for you, but with something even better than what you have already lost. Listen to what the Prophet said. لا يصيب أحد من المسلمين مصيبة فيسترجع عند مصيبته ثم يقول إن لله وإن لله وإن إليه راجعون اللهم أجرني في مصيبتي وخلف لي خيرا منها إلا فعل ذلك به. No Muslim is struck with an affliction and then says استرجع which means إن لله وإن إليه راجعون when the affliction strikes and then says Oh Allah reward me for my loss and give me what is better than it but Allah will do just that. When you face a problem or something difficult happens to you, or you hear some bad news on the phone, you have two options in, term, in terms of your reaction. I'm gonna give you an example. I know some of your problems may be much bigger than that, but you have to think about yourself as I give the example. Think of the problem that you have in your life. For example, I got a new car and I'm driving, and suddenly the car stops working. So I pull over to the side and I'm angry because I paid good money for it. How could this happen? I'm going to arrive late to work, I'm stuck in the middle of the heat, it's really sunny, and the AC is not working, and I'm thinking of all those negative stuff that just happened to me. Then I remember, as a believer, the Prophet's promise, and I say, inna lillahu wa inna ilayhi raji'un. And I remind myself that I'm angry at this car because I own it. But in fact, I own nothing. I myself am actually owned. Allah owns me. Surely I belong to Allah. How can I complain about what he decreed? I'm not an owner of anything. You see, people get mad when they're entitled to something and they don't get it. When you think you deserve something, but you don't get it. So your phone or car stop working, or you lose something special, or you don't get that job, or you get a rejection from that uni, you get angry. But when you say, inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raji'un, first you acknowledge that you deserve nothing. You're saying, I belong to Allah. Everything you get in this life is a gift. It's not something you earned, and that puts you at ease. So when you don't get something or you lose something, you don't get mad because you know that it wasn't yours in the first place. If you take things for granted, it is because shaitan was able to put us in the forgetful state, the state of heedlessness or ghafla. He wants us to be ungrateful and he wants us to complain. But Allah wants us to be conscious of him. So he sends us reminders. An essential part of being a Muslim is to be grateful. To be grateful, Allah wants you to appreciate the world around you. Appreciate the small things and never take anything for granted. And we said this before, but I'll repeat it for the sake of remembrance. Just like Allah gave you all your blessings with his name, the, provi the provider, al razzaq he can take them away from you with his name, Al-Mana, the withholder. So he's been giving you the blessing of smell, taste, and breath for so long, and you haven't thanked him not even once. You are lost in that forgetful state. So he sends you a kind reminder, and you get the flu for a couple of days. Your breathing becomes difficult. You eat, but you can't taste or smell anything. Allah doesn't want to punish you. He just wants to remind you, to nudge you. Don't take things for granted. You are a weak human being, and you belong to me, dear son of Adam. Remember that. Sometimes you don't appreciate a blessing until you, until you lose it. But then Allah heals you with his name as Shafi, the healer, and you become better. So by getting sick and then healed and understanding that it was all from God, you have understood and lived by the name of God, Ash-Shafi, the healer, which is, one of the ninth, the, which is one of the names of God. Without understanding this name, you will not graduate from earth to enter paradise, remember? So by getting sick, Allah is not punishing you, but he's teaching you his name and he's getting you one step closer to paradise, one step closer to him. Whatever problem you have right now, no matter how big it is, you have to know that it's not permanent. Whether it's money problems, health or family problems, emotional or physical problems, it doesn't matter. None of them are permanent. You know why? Because you and I are not permanent. So how can our problems be permanent? We belong to God and to him we shall return. Let's summarize. If you have a problem, there are two ways to react. You either stress, get mad, and start developing negative thoughts of how unlucky you are and how life's not fair, which is the shaitan's way of dealing with things because he wants to put you down. Or you have trust in Allah that he always chooses what's best for you, even if you don't see it. So you use the insurance supplication that Prophet Muhammad told you about, inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raji'un, Allahumma ajirni fi musibati wa khlufni khayran minha, and you will see the wonders of God. He will give you good deeds for your patience and for remembering him, and he will help you deal with the problem and offer you something even better 
than what you have lost. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. If you understand the meaning of inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raja'oon and you use it when you are facing a problem, when you return any problem you have to Allah and you have trust in him that he loves you even when he puts you in a hardship because he wants you to understand one of his names, you will acquire a strength that only true believers have. Just like this kid is super chill, you will be able to face all your problems with zen and calmness because you know Allah the Almighty is by your side. And if you decide not to have trust in Allah and you start worrying about your worldly problems, this is what will happen to you. So change your perspective and don't be like this kid who's having an anxiety attack, although his feet are touching the bottom. The one who worries about worldly matters and doesn't have trust, tawakkul that Allah takes care of everything, will be like this kid. Inshallah, we will explain more about this topic in our next lesson. We will explain how God loves us in the good and the bad, and I will give you more examples of how to shift your perspective during a hardship and have trust in Allah at all times. So stay tuned and assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh.